Welcome to the second episode of our four episode series, Lessons from the 2022 Proxy Season, part of SNC Critical Insights. In this episode, Mark Trevino and Melissa Sawyer, co heads of SNC's corporate governance practice, and Associate Jun Hu discuss trends and environmental proposals from the 2022 proxy season, as well as how to prepare for these proposals in 2023. There has been a steady increase in the number of uh, environmental proposals over the last decade, but it really exploded in 2021 and 2022. In 2021, we saw a 40% year-over-year increase in the number of environmental proposals, and as Melissa already previewed, this year we saw a further 38% year-over-year increase. As you saw in Green Century Capital Management, were the most prolific environmental proponents in 2022 and submitted 45% of all environmental proposals. However, we also saw groups like Sierra Club being active in submitting a number of environmental proposals this year. And I think this had some impact on the engagement companies had with proponents in 2022. In prior years, companies and proponents often settled rather than taking an environmental proposal to a vote, whereas half of the environmental proposals were withdrawn before a vote in the first half of 2021, proponents were much less willing to settle in 2022. As a result of proponents' greater reluctance to settle and a 30% decrease in no-action success, 78% more environmental proposals reached a shareholder vote compared to 2021. Perhaps the most notable trend we observed in the 2022 proxy season on environmental proposals, and that was how granular the proposals were. Even in 2021, we saw proponents make more broad and general requests, like publishing, for example, a sustainability report and then only making granular demands in response to company-specific issues or controversies. However, in 2022, companies have been receiving these more technical, more specific, more granular proposals across the board. For example, some of the 2022 proposals broke down prior proposals into discrete subparts. So instead of requesting broad climate impact policies or commitments, demanding that companies limit their investments and lending activities in intensive sectors. Some specified more detailed standards, for example, instead of generally aligning with the Paris Agreement's goals, setting independently verified science-based targets for particular scopes of GHG emissions. Others prescribed specific means for achieving a previously requested underlying objective. For example, instead of asking for risk oversight enhancement generally with respect to climate, requiring companies to conduct a scenario analysis. Correlated with this increase in granularity, the 2022 environmental proposals received lower levels of support overall. Institutional investors voiced their concern that proponents may be taking a one-size-fits-all approach without fully considering the context in which companies for operating their businesses. For example, citing granular proposals on climate, BlackRock announced it supported 24% of environmental proposals in 2022 compared to 43% in 2021 compared to 43 in 2022, and noted that many climate-related shareholder proposals sought to dictate the pace of companies' energy transition plans despite continued consumer demand, with little regard to company financial performance and other proposals failed to recognize that companies had largely already met their ask. I'll give you a few concrete examples of the new types of environmental proposals we saw in 2022, which we think companies will continue to see in 2023. And one of the main ones was climate-related targets. So in 2021, with limited exceptions, proposals on climate-related targets focused on alignment with the Paris Agreement generally looking at a long-term horizon. A quarter of the 2021 climate target proposals went to a vote and all but one passed. In 2022, proponents submitted a much higher number of climate target proposals, many of which were more specific. 
around 40% of these proposals requested the adoption of some combination of short, medium, and long-term science-based targets for scope three emissions, with a few of these proposals going so far as to request targets for specific subcategories of scope three. None of these more specific proposals passed, and the climate target proposals that did pass mostly included the broader Paris Agreement proposals, which give companies comparatively more freedom to define their own targets and horizons, as well as a request for a company to disclose progress against its previously announced target. Overall, although climate target proposals continue to be settled at high rates, the likelihood of re reaching a settlement with proponents decreased in 2022. Both companies and proponents seem to have been more reluctant to settle, actually. Companies may not want to adopt a climate target this year, especially a scope three target in light of the SEC's proposed climate-related disclosure rules. Even though these rules would not require companies to set a scope three target, once a company sets a target on scope three, not only would it have to provide detailed disclosures on that target, but it would also trigger the requirement to calculate and disclose scope three emissions, even if scope three emissions are not material to that company. We also saw that proponents are staying focused on the role that financial institutions play in climate change. In 2021, five banks received proposals from As You So requesting them to disclose their plans to reduce finance greenhouse gas emissions. In 2022, six banks, including the same five from 2021 and three insurance companies, received a total of 15 proposals relating to their lending activities. And 12 of these 15 proposals asked the financial institutions to adopt lending or underwriting policies that align with the greenhouse gas reduction path outlined in the International Energy Agency's zero emissions by 2050 scenario, which is meant to be consistent with limiting global temperature rise to a 1.5 degree increase without a temperature overshoot. And specifically under these proposals, the proponents asked the financial institutions to limit or end financing of new fossil fuel supplies. Whereas the climate related financing proposals were settled between all of them were settled between proponents and companies in 2021. This year, it was the opposite. All of the IEA related proposals went to a vote, although none received more than 20% of votes cast. The only financing activity proposal that passed in 2022 was a broader request for voluntary reporting on efforts to measure and reduce underwriting related emissions at an insurance company, which received 56% of votes cast. Again, companies may also have been reluctant to settle these proposals since states like West Virginia and Texas have enacted laws that prohibit state pension funds from investing in financial institute that boycott fossil fuel financing. And the last category of environmental proposals I want to highlight is climate-related lobbying proposals, which companies saw in 2021 and 2022, and which we expect to continue to see in 2023, especially given their success in recent years. For the last two years, investors have requested disclosures on the alignment between companies' lobbying activities, including through trade associations and nonprofits and the Paris Agreement goals, focusing on companies that have already announced a commitment to these goals. I think Mark talked about it, the increasing granularity of these political congruency proposals. And we're really seeing it this year in terms of the climate-related arena. In 2022, companies received 16 of these environmental congruency proposals and while last year all of these proposals went to a vote and only one failed to gain majority support, due to the success of these proposals in 2021, only three went to a vote with companies more willing to settle in 2022 than they were in 2021. So here I'm going to turn it over to Mark to talk about his predictions for environmental proposals next year. There are some obvious ones, and the first is it's going to become even more difficult for companies 
to negotiate a compromise or to exclude environmental shareholder proposals. That's a clear trend and it's not going to change in the coming season. Second, within environmental proposals, the focus on climate will continue and it will increase. Given the SEC's climate proposals, I would expect more proposals around voluntary adoption of transition plans, scenario analysis, targets and goals, none of which is mandated by the new proposal. But if you do it, you'll be required to disclose against it in the new proposal. So you're going to see sort of hand and glove type proposals that will align with the SEC's disclosure framework. Proponents are going to continue to be tempted to get too granular and too prescriptive. The SEC's clearly changing perspective on no action requests, which is reflected in the staff legal bulletin, which is reflected in the proposed changes to 1488, will amplify granularity and they will do it in environmental proposals notwithstanding the policy statements and voting records of some of our most significant institutional investors, the proponents will still be tempted and they will do it. And you will see proposals that are more granular. I think you're going to see multiple proposals on the same topic. And I definitely think you're going to see dialogue year over year with respect to shareholder proposals in this area. You already saw it. Once you get one, you're going to get another one whether or not it passed, but then they will be related. All of that comes together and it's like, I don't know what's going to happen with shareholder voting patterns. It's clear that some of the procedural changes that this SEC has enacted are designed in part to hold institutional investors accountable for their votes in this area. And therefore, there may be some pressure on institutional investors to align more closely to their stated policies and to have policies that unlike, for example, BlackRock's are not case by case. On the other hand, we are in the midst of a global energy crisis. We have seen shareholder reaction to proposals that are too granular. Maybe you won't see that. Someone asked me to repeat what I thought they would focus on. I think the focus is on targets and goals, which you already have transition plans, and also I think scenario analysis. If I were a proponent and I knew my proposal wasn't going to get boxed out by the SEC and I really want to see it in your box and they don't want to negotiate with you, scenario analysis is what I would ask for. So hopefully I'm wrong about that. Again, not specific to environmental, but you also need to think about the continued use of exempt solicitations. We saw those in record number this year. Again, another thing that increased by more than a third. There's just a real desire to have dialogue with companies and with each other and with other shareholders around this. And the exempt solicitation is one way to do it. One question I think some issuers are facing is whether there's any benefit or detriment to continuing to do shareholder meetings as virtual meetings in light of some of this activity around shareholder proposals. And in particular, given the interest that some of the states have taken in ESG or anti-ESG related topics, is there a pro or a con that people should be bearing in mind, or are you pretty neutral on virtual versus in-person versus hybrid meetings at this point? Look, uh, you've been practicing for 20-something years. I've been practicing for 30-something years, and so perhaps I'm biased about this, but my view is that in-person annual meetings, I think people have over the past couple of years appreciated that they are, you know, in an environment where people want to have a dialogue, it's more personal, it's more focused on actual investors, it requires a higher investment, no pun intended, in order to engage in that dialogue with an issuer. So I like that. That doesn't mean I haven't forgotten what happened in 2008 and 2009 around shareholder meetings and having people actually boycott or attend meetings. But I think in this environment, where everything is recorded and taped and broadcast, having an in-person meeting probably is the better part of valor. Thank you for listening to SNC Critical Insights. 
For more information about SNC's coverage of the 2022 proxy season, please visit us on the web at www.solchrome.com. Thank you.